Hello, everyone. My name is Ronice Owens, and we are pleased that you all could join us for this week's lecture series in volume seven of our The No Neuropsychology Didactic Series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. And this series was created by trainees, an early career neuropsychologist, including standing members of our No Neuropsychology Board, as well as our awesome members on the current rotating committee. One of the main goals of No Neuropsychology is to provide free didactics, and you can find all of our lectures on our YouTube channel account. So subscribe and get updates as new lectures are uploaded. And new to this year, No Neuropsychology is our collaboration with Absent, multi-site didactic initiative and developing learning and discussion questions for selected webinars. And you can access these on our website. No Neuropsychology is also excited to announce that transcripts are now available for all lectures in volumes one and two. Additional transcripts will be added over time. And there are a few disclaimers to cover today. First, this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology. The views of the speakers are their own. Any clinical or research data contained herein may not be used without express permission of the speaker and no neuropsychology. And before we start, here are the disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website later this week. Today is our fourth lecture in volume seven of our series. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Suzanne Penna for today's lecture title, Cognitive Functioning and Neuroendocrine Disorders. Dr. Penna is an associate professor and the division director of neuropsychology and behavioral health in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Penna is heavily involved in training at the local and national level. To that end, she is the current president of the Association for Internship Training and in Clinical Neuropsychology, treasurer of the Association of Postdoctoral Training and Clinical Neuropsychology, and co-treasurer of the Clinical Neuropsychology Council. Most recently, she has served on the steering committee as treasurer of the Minnesota Conference to update training in neuropsychology. Her clinical and research interests are in the assessment of cognitive and emotional functioning with individuals with acquired brain injury and in individuals with medical illness impacting brain functioning, such as endocrine disorders. She has published on cognitive and emotional functioning in Cushing's disease and is closely involved with Emory's Department of Endocrinology in the assessment and treatment of individuals with neuroendocrine disorders. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Penna as our lecturer for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, so I will go ahead and get started and see if I can successfully share my screen in front of everybody. Um, All righty. And let me go ahead and start from the beginning. And all right, so hopefully everybody can see this. Um, and I think I'm pretty sure that Dr. Block would inform me if you can't, so I'm just gonna proceed as normal. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about cognitive functioning and neuroendocrine disorders. Um, and these are fairly rare disorders, um, but you may, um, see a few of these in your clinical practice, and it's good to at least be familiar with them because they do come with cognitive deficits. Um, just sort of, you know, 10,000 foot overview, basically the endocrine system itself is comprised of eight major organs, which we call glands. They're throughout the body that produce and regulate hormones. Um, hormones essentially regulate all bodily functions and impact all body systems, including but not limited to metabolism, growth and development, mood and emotional functioning, fertility and sexual functioning, sleep and blood pressure. So these are really integral to um, homeostasis, behavioral functioning, cognitive functioning. And if there is a disruption, um, obviously, this will cause problems. So essentially endocrine disorders result in hormone levels that are either too high, too low, 
or result if the body doesn't respond to the hormones in the typical way. So the most common endocrine disorders that people are aware of include diabetes, thyroid disorder, sex hormone disorders, such as polycystic ovary disease and neuroendocrine disorders. So it's this latter category, the neuroendocrine disorders that I wanted to talk to you about today. Now I will say these are the most rare of the endocrine disorders, but again, in terms of neuropsychology, the most likely, um, I would say a referral that you are uh, likely to see of the endocrine disorders. So let's first start with the endocrine glands in the central nervous system. Um, there are three glands, some would say two and a half, but um, the pineal gland, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And this is where they're located in the brain. So you can see sort of really right um, at the base of the brain, kind of anterior behind the eyes. And the reason why I say two and a half is the hypothalamus, some people consider it a gland, some people really say, no, it's part of eloquent brain tissue. So it's this sort of like, um, I would say, it's, it's clearly important in the endocrine system, whether or not it's actually a gland is really sort of up for um, discussion or semantics. So essentially the hypothalamus is the master gland, the part of the brain that regulates all endocrine system functioning. So it relays information from the nervous system to the other glands via the pituitary. So essentially you can think of um, the hypothalamus as sort of the man behind the curtain, but the one doing the actual work is the pituitary. Um, and so the pituitary, which we're gonna talk most of our time about today, um, is essentially at the base of the hypothalamus. And it's divided into two sections, the anterior, which is the adeno, oh God, the adeno hypothesis, and the posterior, the neuro hypothesis. And um, the anterior pituitary uh, contains glandular cells that release uh, six hormones into circulation. The posterior is the part of the, the pituitary that receives input from the hypothalamus, in addition to making and secreting oxytocin and vas vasopressin. So really you can kind of see one is sort of the, the posterior is receiving input from the brain. The anterior again is ex, uh, expressing the hormones through circulation. Um, so here we go. Here's another sort of nice picture of the pituitary and you can see sort of the anterior and posterior section. So the posterior, you've got your two hormones, uh, vasopressin and oxytocin. And then um, the anterior, lobe of the pituitary, which uh, releases um, adenocorticotropin releasing hormone, which releases cortisol, growth hormone, uh, follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, and prolactin. Whew, okay, I got them all. So anyway, as you can see, very, very tiny part of the brain involved in ex um, quite a bit of regulation and um, secretion to keep your body going. Finally, there's the pineal gland. And this little guy is in the very back here, sort of like right in the center, smack dab in the center of the brain. Um, this is actually where uh, Rene Descartes thought the seat of the soul was. And he was really wrong. Actually, all the pineal gland does is produce the hormone melatonin, which is important in sleep regulation and circadian rhythm. So, um, I mean, it's great, don't get me wrong, it's great for sleep, but that's really pretty much all it does. So we're not gonna be spending too much time on the pineal gland today. Um, so let's talk about disorders of the um, neuroendocrine glands. So first are disorders of the pineal gland. And as I may allude, uh, have alluded to, there are really no uh, neuroendocrine diseases related to the pineal gland. Um, it can be impacted by injury, which is extremely rare, again, given its location in the center of the brain. Uh, occasionally it can be impacted by brain tumor or by calcification. But even when it is impacted by these factors, there's really no known neurocognitive effects of damage or injury to the pineal gland, apart um, from any sort of, sort of extraneous damage that was due to a tumor or secondary to injury. So if the pineal gland is uh, disturbed or damaged in any way, really just taking melatonin um, orally is kind of the way to go, but there's really no cognitive deficits associated with damage to the pineal gland. Um, make sense? Okay, 
that's enough about the pineal gland. Let's spend the rest of our time talking about pituitary diseases. And again, um, you know, the hypothalamus is tangentially involved in these, but I did really want to focus on the pituitary, um, just given its sort of role, its primary role in the neuroendocrine system. So when you look at pituitary diseases, they're sort of divided into two components. Um, and most of the diseases associated with pituitary arise from tumors. Um, these are called adenomas and specifically pituitary adenomas. And there's really two types. There's what's called the non-functioning or non-secreting pituitary adenomas or the functional and secreting adenomas. And they're distinguished by whether or not these tumors secrete hormones. Um, so the majority of pituitary adenomas are non-functioning or non-secreting um, and typically can cause some cognitive issues, but not nearly as many cognitive issues as your functional or secreting adenomas. So the disorders that I really wanted to uh, focus on today are uh, fairly rare which are most pituitary diseases are fairly rare, but they do have very significant neuropsychological consequences. Um, so first I wanted to start with your non-functioning or non-secreting um, adenomas and then move into the functional and secreting adenomas and the disorders that they cause. Okay, so first let's start with our pituitary adenomas. So these again are ben considered benign tumors in that um, you know, they, they typically are very slow growing. They're space occupying, but again, they're not secreting hormones and they don't impact the hormone, hormonal functioning of the pituitary. So um, good news is, is about 50% of pituitary adenomas are non-functioning. Um, so these are rare tumors that also um, most of the time, well, I guess half of the time are causing really just no problems at all. They can occasionally cause cognitive changes due to mass effect on the pituitary and surrounding structures, but the tumors themselves are not causing diseases. So they're really, again, they fall into two categories, microadenomas and macroadenomas. And they're really defined by how big they are. So microadenomas measure less than one centimeter or 10 millimeters. Macroadenomas measure greater than one centimeter. So this picture here is an example of a macroadenoma. Um, pituitary adenomas typically grow on the anterior pituitary, so near um, sort of the uh, front part of the pituitary. Um, again, space occupying, and that's pretty much all they do. Um, in terms of treatment, so what do we do about these? So uh, this is pretty easy. If they're asymptomatic, really, most of the time it's a watch and wait. Uh, serial imaging is typical. I will say particular with, particularly with microadenomas, these are usually discovered incidentally. Somebody gets a brain scan for something else and they're like, oh, you got a little pituitary microadenoma in there too, um, which really just serves to freak out the patient but doesn't actually cause any uh, difficulty whatsoever. When they are symptomatic, and again, these typically tend to be macroadenomas, so larger than a centimeter, um, your typical symptoms are going to be things like headaches uh, due to mass effect. And more rarely, sometimes you might get visual changes because again, these things grow big enough that they will impact on the optic tract and optic chiasm. So again, remember the location of the pituitary essentially right behind the eyes. So in this case, surgical resection is performed. And usually once uh, they're resected surgically, there's really no other treatment that is needed apart from um, radiation, more as a preventative than any, than any other uh, reason. The way they typically um, surgically approach this is what's called a transphenoidal approach um, to minimize cognitive impact on surgery. So they essentially go through your nose um, and sort of break the cribiform plate back behind your nose and um, remove the tumor that way. So this way they never actually touch eloquent brain tissue, um, which is great because your only other option of getting to this is through a bitemporal craniotomy and that's gonna cause a whole lot of uh, difficulty. So really transphenoidal uh, surgery is kind of the, um, 
the method of choice for removing these tumors. Um, there is very little limit, uh, limited literature indicating cognitive deficits with pituitary adenomas, even with radiation. So again, even when these tumors are fairly large, uh, once they're removed, there's really um, very little impact on cognitive functioning, which is great news. Good. So what about the types of non-functioning uh, adenomas that do cause cognitive problems? So there's really just one specific example, and um, this is known as a craniopharyngioma. This is more commonly seen in the pediatric literature, although adults can get this as well. <coughs> um, it's very rare. Only 10 to 15% of pituitary tumors are craniopharyngiomas, and they are again considered a benign tumor. The problem with them though, is they're a benign tumor, but they're in a, they grow in a really, really bad location. So essentially what happens is they grow in between your pituitary gland and hypothalamus and press against the hypothalamus, opticiasm, and pituitary. So this picture really nicely illustrates that it's a small tumor in a bad spot. Um, it does tend to be very slow growing. So again, typically what you're going to see is uh, difficulty again, headaches, um, and then pretty significant hormonal imbalances because again, it impinges on that hypothalamus. So the hallmarks of craniopharyngioma, and this is typically what gets somebody into the doctor, is the development of uh, diabetes insipidus. So this is, um, not really what we consider diabetes, but they, they call it that way because there's some shared Greek root. But essentially what happens is um, the tumor blocks production of, it, of um, vasopressin. I'm not sure if it's vasopressin or vasopressin, but um, antidiuretic hormone. How about that? ADH. And so essentially what this causes is massive thirst and excessive urination and can cause things like hyponatremia, um, dehydration, and, you know, really just um, lots of sort of metabolic problems. And it is cured by essentially um, supplementation of, um, of ADH. The other thing it causes is a bitemporal hemianopsia. So we all learned when we were learning, remember this picture? We all love this picture of the optic track. Um, there is really only one thing that can cause a bitemporal hemianopsia, and that is damage to the optic chiasm. This is the tumor that will do it. Um, so essentially what it does is it will press on the optic chiasm resulting in this bitemporal hemianopsia. So essentially only, um, you can only see central vision. So you really have lost peripheral vision. Now, fortunately, craniopharyngioma does tend to be fairly cystic. And um, again, with that transphenoidal surgery can be easily removed. And as long as this um, um, is done fairly quickly, sometimes these visual changes resolve. Um, I know theoretically di diabetes insipidus could resolve as well. I will say of the very few cases I've seen of this, that's never actually happened. Um, people continue to require um, oral uh, supplementation of um, antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so let's talk neuropsych functioning in craniopharyngioma. So again, they remove it using this transphenoidal approach as much as possible. Um, occasionally, it will regrow or it will be so big that the transphenoidal approach will not work and they do have to do a uh, frontal craniotomy and there you're gonna see a lot more difficulty. But in terms of the literature, um, really what they've seen more than anything else is episodic memory deficits and specifically again with learning and memory. Um, in the first review of literature that I saw, they really didn't specify, they just said episodic memory deficits. Um, they didn't really quantify if this was learning, um, memory or retrieval, but you know, in general, they're like memory problems. Um, and really sort of the hypothesized mechanism here is that the tumor interferes with the mammillary bodies and the mammalothalamic tract. Um, so patients who have these hypothalamic involvements in particular, are really likely to have amnestic memory deficits. Again, so you think of the mammillary bodies and they're, when you typically think of the mammillary bodies, you think Korsakoff's dementia. You think, um, okay, 
you know, people who have uh, malfunctioning mammillary bodies due to um, lack of thymine. Well, if the mammillary bodies are damaged and the mammalothalamic tract is also damaged, you're going to have the same sorts of results. So really sort of an amnestic memory profile, which tends to also be characterized by some confabulation as well. Um, there is some evidence for prefrontal cortex damage and executive dysfunction, but it's really not consistent. I, you know, the literature more broadly supports mostly these amnestic memory deficits seen in craniopharyngioma. I will say, you know, this is pretty rare. I've actually only seen three patients with craniopharyngioma in my career, but I will say all three of them had very severe memory deficits um, and really um, not a whole lot of deficits in any other area. So again, it's that frontal memory system that is impacted in this disorder. Okay, now let's move on. So those are your non-functional pituitary adenomas. Now let's move to the functional pituitary adenomas. So we have, so we've got your pituitary adenomas here. So 50% are non-secreting and now we've got our 50% that are secreting. So it's typically this latter group that really causes the neuroendocrine disorders. Um, on the plus side, the most common uh, secreting pituitary adenoma is known as a prolactinoma, which is, occurs, it accounts for about 40% of pituitary tumors. They tend to not have significant, significant cognitive deficits. Um, they definitely exist, but they're not nearly as bad as maybe other neuroendocrine disorders. So a, a prolactinoma causes excess production of prolactin. So this is usually caused by a... Um, secreting a microadenoma, so a very small tumor that secretes prolactin. And so what happens is, is this leads to uh, hypogonadism and uh, galactorrhea in both sexes. So that essentially means lactation. So, um, you know, obviously this can be pretty alarming for people that this happens to. Um, they, there do tend to be some gender specific or sex uh, uh, specific changes. So decreased libido and sexual potency in men. Um, for women, amenorrhea, so loss of the menstrual period and infertility. Um, so the hypogonadism and galactorrhea occur in both sexes, but then there are these sex-specific difficulties. Essentially, this is largely treated with medication and hormone supplementation if needed. So this can, um, this excess production of um, Prolactin it can be medically managed, and most of the time it is. And sometimes if needed for hormone supplementation for these other sex hormones, that's also used. So in terms of cognitive effects of prolactinoma, uh, there's very little systematic research on this. There are a ton of anecdotal reports of cognitive impairments. Um, but again, you know, really sort of good solid research. Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, studies out there. So there was one study that was specific to men where they found that higher prolactin levels correlated negatively with both cognitive functioning and uh, well-being scores. And high prolactin was also associated with high scores on depression scales. Um, the only downside of this particular um, research study was these were all largely self-report. So there were no really objective cognitive measurements to really sort of fully assess if the cognitive functioning was secondary to depression um, or something else. So in a more recent studies, they found that uh, men and women with prolactinomas did have significantly lower scores on verbal and nonverbal memory and attention measures than the healthy volunteers. And so these same authors really sort of dove into it in a, a more recent study in 2015, where they, uh, I'm sorry, in 2022, excuse me, where they really looked at aspects of attention, specifically attention, um, working memory and more complex attention in a case control study. So what they found was higher prolactin levels were associated with poor performance on measures of working memory and attentional switching. So they used the test of everyday attention. Um, and so it's really a lot of spatial working memory that they saw, some speed of performance, um, and again, your auditory verbal working memory, so your digits backwards, where they really found some difficulty. And that might very well be related to these uh, reports of uh, lower scores of verbal and nonverbal memory. If people are having difficulty with complex attention, then this could be impacting encoding and then the um, learning of new information. 
So, uh, which can again, very often be attributed as a memory problem because if you don't learn it, how are you supposed to remember it later? Uh, what they didn't find, which they were surprised, was there's really no significant correlation between cognitive processes and tumor size. So the size of the tumor didn't matter. However, the um, what does seem to uh, account a lot for um, are the level of prolactin levels. So the higher the prolactin level, the more likely it is that you're going to have cognitive deficits. So uh, this one study nicely showed that when prolactin levels are medically controlled, cognitive functioning normalizes. So, um, you know, that's really good news for anybody with a prolactinoma. So high prolactin is going to cause some cognitive issues. Um, if you normalize this, then perhaps this might, um, then your, well, theoretically, um, your cognitive functioning will return to normal as well. So these authors really speculated that uh, this was due to the prolactin dop dopamine feedback loop. So uh, remember, dopamine has um, four kind of um, four distinct channels, and one of them is the tuberoinfundibular dopaminergic pathway, which is a mouthful, but I really like to say infundibular. Um, but one of these again is uh, impacted by prolactin. So again, when there's an excess of prolactin. Um, dopamine response by increasing, which then turns off the prolactin. In the case of a prolactinoma, this feedback loop doesn't occur. So essentially what ends up happening is prolactin increases, dopamine also increases, and there's no feedback turning that off. So essentially what happens is, um, you know, the authors are speculating it's this excess of dopamine, which is really underlying these cognitive difficulties with complex attention and working memory. Um, okay, so uh, now we've come to our, um, so uh, questions of psychiatric symptoms in patients with prolactinoma, yes. So essentially you are seeing higher rates of depression. Um, as to why that might be, whether or not that's due to uh, dopamine dysregulation or just the fact that, um, you know, you've got a loss of libido and you're lactating, um, that could also cause a lot of distress uh, that your body is not doing what it's supposed to do. So I think there's an open question as to why, um, why there are higher rates of depression seen in prolactinoma than in the general population. But I would certainly speculate that it is both a um, dopamine response as well as just a um, distress of what's happening to bodily changes. Okay, so in terms of Cushing's disease, so um, I will probably spend quite a bit of time on this, uh, mostly because this is an area of research interest of mine, but also because this is um, a fairly, un I won't say underdiagnosed, but this is a fairly hard to diagnose condition. And people tend to walk around um, for years with this disorder before uh, appropriately getting um, a diagnosis. And this causes a great deal of distress for people that have it. So it is a rare disorder, um, but it is an excellent model for, um, for depression in terms of physiologic depression. And it's an excellent model of just the role of hormones in the body. So Cushing's disease is again characterized by elevated levels of serum cortisol in the body. So this tends, again, it's due to a pituitary microadenoma, but this adenoma, instead of secreting prolactin, this one is secreting um, cortisol. So essentially what happens is the body starts producing cortisol out of control. And the major issue with this is uh, cortisol mediates the stress response in the body. So I think we've probably all heard of cortisol and its role in depression, where again, you'll see this, um, HPA axis, uh, basically the feedback loops and depression aren't working as well as they uh, normally do. In Cushing's, take this and exponentially increase it. So essentially what ends up happening with this hypersecretion of cortisol, and I will say that Cushing's disease specifically is caused by this uh, pituitary microadenoma. There's also what's known as Cushing's syndrome. Um, and it essentially is the same thing. The body is producing excess cortisol. It can occasionally be caused by uh, tumors of the adrenal glands. 
which again are the actual um, glands that create cortisol. So these are on top of the kidneys. This is extremely rare. I think it occurs in less than 5% of cases of Cushing's syndrome. Um, or you can have medically induced Cushing syndromes brought by excessive or long-term use of steroids, so glucocorticoids. So very often when people are receiving very high doses of steroids for say something like um, transplantation, organ transplantation or bone marrow transplantation, it can be induced by these high levels of steroids. Um, however, in... Um, in steroid-induced Cushing disease, when you stop the steroids, the Cushing's goes away. When it's caused by these tumors, it does not. So your symptoms of Cushing's disease are central weight gain. And what I mean by that is uh, weight gain in the belly, striae, which are very severe stretch marks. They're very deep, they're dark, they're purple, muscle weakness, changes in hair distribution. Um, so again, um, Women will lose hair on their head and it will grow on their face. Um, mood lability, irritability, difficulty with concentration and memory, very easy bruising, um, what's called moon facies. So the distribution of fat also sort of um, affects the distribution of fat on the face where it looks like your face sort of flattens out a little bit. Hypertension, um, changes in sex hormones. So particularly in women, amenorrhea. So you stop getting your period and uh, panic symptoms. So again, remember, uh, think about cortisol. Cortisol is released under stress. Um, this is your fight or flight response. So think about it. If you um, are scared of something, your body is producing cortisol. If your body does not stop secreting cortisol, um, this, you know, this stress response doesn't go away. So this can very easily induce panic. Um, so if this is essentially having a panic attack 24 seven in addition to all of these other physical changes that are happening. Um, here's the problem. Some of these changes occur fairly slowly. And um, this does occur. Um, uh, here's a lovely uh, demonstration of what happens here. And I just, I do wanna show you again. So you see your adrenal glands, you've got a red and round face. That's so your moon faces, your hypertension. Um, purple striae, again, on your belly, um, the fat uh, uh, deposits on your abdomen. And then there's also one called a, uh, I forgot what it's called, but it's just sort of a hump on the back of your neck, muscle wasting in the extremities. Um, again, sex changes in females. So um, you are, again, facial hair is a big issue uh, for women, um, loss of periods in males, erectile dysfunction is a problem. Cushing's disease for some reason tends to be more female specific. So more women get it than men. Um, the problem with this are also, um, are also sort of in uh, related to, I will just say the problems women have in healthcare in general. Uh, because these are slow growing, let me see if I can move this on. Uh, here we go. I'll go back one. Um, these problems tend to occur over months um, and it typically takes people up to two to three years to get correctly diagnosed with Cushing's disease. So what ends up happening is a woman will go to her doctor and say, you know, something's wrong here. I've gained a lot of weight and I'm, I'm depressed and I'm anxious. And their doctor will say, well, you're depressed and anxious because you're fat. Um, or, you know, you're tired all the time because you're out of shape and, you know, X, Y, or Z. So essentially what's happened is people are not correctly diagnosed, misdiagnosed for really a very long time um, until somebody puts the pieces together. And, you know, so it, it, you don't, so amenorrhea is usually what does it when your periods stop. But even then people are like, well, you know, if this occurs in your forties, well, you know, you're, you're going through menopause or something else. So this tends to be a really, you know, a major issue um, with, with people because, you know, they think that they're crazy and essentially what they're getting feedback from their doctors is, well, yeah, you know, of course you're this way because look at these physical changes you're having or your hair is falling out because you're stressed out. Um, and, and really what it is the whole time is this little tiny tumor that is secreting cortisol out of control. 
So obviously you can see, I, I am feeling fairly strongly about this, but I've seen a lot of really, really tragic cases of people who have had a lot of trouble getting the correct diagnosis and have had a lot of uh, distress as a result. So you've been diagnosed with Cushing's disease. What do we do with it? So again, the first thing they do, surgery. So this transphenoidal approach is most commonly used. It has a 70 to 90% success rate. So it's a good success rate. It's not a great success rate. And the reason why it's you know, good but not great is when I say microadenoma, sometimes these uh, pituitary tumors are so small that they really can't even be imaged. So we're talking like less than a millimeter, but that's enough to sort of wreak havoc um, on your cortisol system. So after the surgery, they, uh, people will require medical management of cortisol and other pituitary hormones that are also impacted. So specifically things like growth hormone and their sex hormones. Uh, radiation is very often used as well to prevent recurrence. Um, and unfortunately, again, because of the size of these tumors, because they are so small, recurrence can happen if they, uh, the tumor is not fully removed. So there can be uh, regrowth and it happens in about, you know, 15 to 20% of cases. And if it does require an additional surgery, they will typically take out the entire pituitary gland. And um, a person will just take um, oral hormonal supplements for the rest of their lives. And um, which is still better than cortisol going out of control. So effects of chronic, uh, chronic cortisol secretion on the brain. So first and most obviously, you're going to have um, significant psychological symptoms. So we think about the role of cortisol in chronic stress. We think about the role of cortisol in um, anxiety and depression. Psychological disorders are extremely common in Cushing's, both due to the hypersecretion of cortisol and again, the distress people feel to the physical changes in their bodies. Um, so your most common disorders, your rates of depression are around 80 to 90% um, in active Cushing's disease, anxiety around 60%, and full-blown mania in about 30%. So um, I did have one patient with um, Cushing's who had, um, who it, it induced a, man, a manic episode with her. And in fact, she was supposed to I still remember she was supposed to go pick up her mom at the airport and her mom called and she said she never showed up and she went to neurosurgery instead and she hadn't slept for like six days at that point. And I called up neurosurgery. I'm like, whatever you do, keep her there. I was like, she's manic. She's, she's not stable right now. You've got to get her like into surgery as quickly as possible. And fortunately, the surgery did cure her mania like instantly. Um, okay. So what about post-treatment though? Okay, so during Cushing's, of course, you know, you've got hypersecretion of cortisol, of course you're going to have um, psychiatric symptoms. So what about post-treatment? So the good news is that yes, most of the time psychiatric difficulties do decrease. Um, pr uh, progressive improvement in depression is seen at three, six, and 12 months post-operatively. Um, however, still about 25% of people are still reporting um, significant rates of, of major depression. So people are still depressed, still anxious, but much lower rates than they were before. So instead of again, 80 to 90%, you've got 25%, which is still fairly high. Um, again, depression does remain the prevailing psychiatric diagnosis um, even years after surgery. And this has been replicated multiple times. And um, it's really interesting that again, cortisol in all of these people is normal. So, but patients are still anecdotally reporting persistent cognitive and psychiatric complaints affecting their quality of life. So the question is, why is this? If cortisol has you know, returned to normal, then why are people still reporting cognitive and psychiatric problems? So, um, you know, we have talked about the psychiatric symptoms. Let's talk about the cognitive symptoms. Um, cognitive impairment is very common in active Cushing's disease, specific areas of impairment, attention and concentration, memory, visual spatial skills, and executive functioning. Again, think of that stress response. So, um, you know, you have your, your ability to sit still and be thoughtful is probably impacted by this um, hyper secretion of stress hormone in your body. So again, um, one of the studies really sort of hypothesized that this chronic cortisol hypersecretion exacerbates cognitive aging. So this was kind of a really interesting study. 
that what you saw was people with Cushing's when compared to normal same age controls had um, verbal memory impairments. Um, but then when they compared them to people who were 15 years older, they looked about the same. So essentially what they're saying is that, you know, their performance looks on, on these cognitive tests of memory and general cognitive functioning looked basically the same as somebody who is a good decade and a half older than them. So why, what's going on here? Um, well, essentially these glucocorticoid um, receptors and mineral corticoid receptors of cortisol are widely distributed throughout the brain and they bind to cortisol. So the specific areas of the brain that have the most, the highest density of cortisol receptors are the hippocampus, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. So you can see memory, um, obviously fear and anger response, and then prefrontal cortex, which is your executive functioning complex attention. So uh, it does not, it, it sort of follows that these would be the types of deficits you would see in these areas. So, um, and they've actually shown studies that um, during the active phase of Cushing's that there is actual uh, shrinkage in the hippocampus. On the plus side, again, once this um, Cushing's has remitted, these gray matter structures do bounce back. So the hippocampus does return to normal size um, and it occurs pretty quickly. Um, however, there is some evidence that the thalamus continues to be affected uh, by, you know, even, even though Cushing's is normalized, this hypersecretion has caused some potentially long-term problems. Um, also, there might be white matter changes, which do not appear reversible, even in long-term remission. Um, so what you see is sort of these white, mod uh, white matter integrity remains uh, reduced and potentially white matter hyperintensities, potentially because of the hypertension and cardiac issues that go along with Cushing's um, are seen uh, very often in neuroimaging. Okay, so long-term cognitive changes in Cushing's syndrome. So um, this is sort of the area of research that our lab has been involved in. You know, there's this idea of, is there overlap between persistent psychological symptoms um, and cognitive dysfunction? So is this really, um, is this the lingering depression? Because some of the, uh, one of the hallmarks of depression are changes in concentration, difficulty focusing, trouble with uh, learning and memory, or are these cognitive changes independent of um, potential emotional uh, consequences of Cushing's? So there are very few studies looking at cognitive functioning and Cushing's syndrome that control for the role of emotional functioning. So um, really in terms of cognitive functioning, there's not a lot there that use anything other than self-report. Um, one of them looked at cognitive changes in patients with Cushing's prior to treatment. So this is again, active Cushing's and didn't really look at the role of emotional functioning and cognition at all. Um, so this was the study that found these difficulties with um, executive functioning, memory and complex attention. Uh, the second study was definitely better. Um, it compared neuropsych performance in Cushing's patients in remission to controls and a controls match for age, gender and education. Um, part of them were normal controls, and then part of them were controls that had um, surgical treatment for non-functioning pituitary macroadenoma. So again, the same surgery that's involved in Cushing's, but without that hypersecretion of cortisol. So again, what they saw was impairments in memory and executive functioning Cushing's group as compared to controls and the pituitary macroadenoma group. Um, they did assess for depression, but they really didn't. Um, they didn't report the results, so it's there's no way to tell how much of this was an overlap with depression, how much depression potentially mediated this, this response. So in terms of limitations to address, um, the gaps in cognitive domains are um, prior studies use very brief cognitive screens. There's very few um, studies that use standard neuropsychological tests. Um, they really haven't focused on sustained attention. And even on tests of memories, study is not, studies are not delineating the difference between component processes of memory. They just report a global memory score. So we don't know, okay, is this an encoding problem? Is this a forgetting problem? Is this a retrieving uh, problem? There's really, it's not really reported or even being measured. So um, our group um, tried to address this and um, Dr. Mary Fernandez, who is also on this talk right now, is uh, one of our main sort of um, 
I guess, the PI behind a lot of these things. So I'm throwing her under the bus for both this study and the second study, which um, was her dissertation, that she really does need to publish. Anyway, uh, for study one, we really wanted to just see what characterizes patients with Cushing's disease. This is a very low frequency dis disease um, to the point where Emory sees um, all patients with Cushing's disease in a six um, state sort of, I guess, catchment area. And over three years, we only saw 18 patients with Cushing's disease. So that's what I mean by this is very, very rare. Um, the highest subjective complaints were in attention and increased irritability, but in objective testing, what you're seeing is sustained attention reductions and reduced initial encoding on memory tests. So essentially, the memory itself, so that very first trial of a CVLT, the very first time they get the story on the whims, um, is where you're seeing declines, not with the overall learning curve or retention, but retention is reduced because of poor initial learning. We also found visual spatial deficits specifically on judgment of line orientation um, with people with Cushing's. 60% of the people that we saw scored in the clinically elevated range for both somatization and depressive symptomology. So again, somatization is not something that is typically um, seen in other studies, um, but you can see why if it takes somebody three years to have their um, um, disorder diagnosed that they may develop a hypersensitivity to physical functioning. Um, we did do a, an exploratory analysis and this was strictly exploratory because of our low sample size. We looked at nine patients with active Cushing's and nine in remission. Um, patients with active Cushing's had slower processing speed compared to uh, those who were in remission. And um, those who were in remission actually had more deficits than the active Cushing's in terms of sustained attention and with that learning and encoding on the verbal memory test. Okay. This was also sort of interesting what you see. We looked at um, emotional functioning. So the blue are people in remission, the orange are people with active Cushing's. So you see rates of somatization remain the same even after Cushing's had remitted. Um, rates of depression were actually worse in people with um, remission than people in active Cushing's and rates of anxiety were about the same. So yes, there are definitely long-term emotional um, problems following Cushing's disease that are not well understood, um, but definitely persist and are affecting quality of life. Okay, so there were some open questions as a result of this study. And the first was how much of the cognitive difficulties are due to psychiatric conditions? Um, and then the second is what aspect of, of Cushing's disease and treatment underlies these cognitive impairments, especially in patients who have achieved biomedical remission? So again, their cortisol is normal. So why are there still cognitive impairments? Why are there still psychological impairments? Are there treatment related factors? Is it, uh, do, not TSA, TSS, was it the surgery itself that caused problems? Is it the radiation that's causing problems? Are there cardiovascular health comorbidities that are affecting the brain or are there other pituitary deficiencies that are causing the, the difficulties? Well, we couldn't answer all of them. So we picked two and the two are highlighted in yellow. And this is what Dr. Fernandez actually did for her dissertation. And um, as you can see here, unpublished, Dr. Fernandez, please publish this. Anyway, uh, the goals of the study were to isolate the effects of high cortisol on cognitive emotional functioning by using patients with non-functioning pituitary adenomas as a control group. So these are people who had pituitary adenomas that were resected. So same surgery. So this way we're eliminating that sort of question about is it surgery that's the problem. And then here also we wanted to look at if any of the cognitive impairments were attributable to psychiatric diagnoses, depression, anxiety. So really looking at that uh, mediation model. Um, oops, sorry. So what we found was the only difference between Cushing's and non-functioning adenoma groups was processing speed. And um, interestingly enough, the longer a person was in remission, the slower performance on processing speed. So essentially what we're thinking is long-term cognitive outcomes may not be due solely to that um, high cortisol. And um, what, is, what was interesting was that a significant proportion of each group, so both the adenomas and the Cushing's, exhibited clinical levels of impairments in attention, processing speed, and visual memory. 
So yes, the surgery may have had something to do with these cognitive issues. And potentially that um, cortisol really may not have a lot to do with cognitive effects above and beyond the surgery itself. There, and this was probably the most surprising, there were very limited associations between anxiety and depression and cognitive functioning. They were really unrelated. So it's, it looked like in this um, group that it was not a function of anxiety, residual anxiety and depression that were causing these cognitive issues. Okay, last but not least, um, I wanna talk about acromegaly. This is probably the most rare of the pituitary disorders. Um, again, caused by a um, secreting microadenoma, um, which causes excess growth hormone to be secreted. So in your Cushing's disease, you've got your uh, cortisol that's being secreted. In your uh, prolactinoma, you've got prolactin that's being uh, hypersecreted. And in acromegaly, you've got a hypersecretion of growth hormone. Um, this is extremely rare. So three to 14 out of every 100,000 people have been diagnosed with this. It mostly impacts adults in middle age. I will say when this does occur in children, this re uh, results in gigantism. So essentially before the, if this occurs before the bone plates close, um, it essentially causes extremely um, rapid growth. And so this is sort of a classic example. I don't know if you guys know of Andre the Giant because I might be dating myself, but this is Andre the Giant. Seven foot five, um, and he weighed 520 pounds um, and had acromegaly as a child. Um, so if you look up gigantism, this is essentially what's causing it. Um, however, in most cases, acromegaly occurs in adulthood, so after the bone plates have fused. So what you see instead is this very insidious onset. It can be years and years and years before diagnosis. People complain of headaches, increased sweating, joint pain, hypertension, and most notably, changes in bone structure and density. So what you see are an enlargement of hands, feet, forehead, jaw and nose, thicker skin, and deepening of the voice. So you can see here a normal hand, and you can see these, these bones have thickened in the hands. The, these are really nice descriptive pictures of people with acromegaly. So the, the top, you can see age nine, 16, you can see her facial features are starting to broaden out, age 33, so the jaw is becoming more prominent and thicker. And then you can see at age 52, she's holding her hands out and you can see that very classic um, acromegaly in the hands and in the jawline and the bone structure. Um, this is a woman who more recently, so as, as you can see, can be very subtle. So uh, uh, prior to her diagnosis of acromegaly, and then you can see as she ages, again, these changes in bone structure that are fairly subtle, but again, do result in um, changes over time. Um, on the plus side, once you've actually come to the attention of the doctor and, and you actually like, there are changes that are visible, um, you know, tumors are larger than one centimeter. So they're typically macroadenomas and you can typically see them on neuroimaging. Um, so that's one way to diagnose them. The other way is to uh, look at um, growth hormone. And so they'll do a growth hormone suppression test uh, to see how the body responds to blood, to uh, glucose. And if there's high levels of glucose, normally growth hormone falls. If not, it'll stay high. Um, and that's how you diagnose it. Um, unfortunately, there are there is some mixed literature about neuropsych functioning here, um, but they're typically um, memory and executive problems. Um, the, the literature is really sort of mixed. You know, some people are saying yes, there's problems compared to controls, but when you compare them to people with um, non-functioning adenomas, they look about the same. Um, what they are seeing, again, they tend to be, again, more of this prefrontal cortex stuff. Um, so difficulty in attention, memory, um, and executive functioning. Um, let's see here. There is some evidence on MRI that there are some gray matter changes in the hippocampal um, structure, particularly early in the disease course. But again, it's so hard to diagnose that, you know, this is a very, very limited sample size with not a lot of replication. In terms of how we treat it, here's the problem. You, you try to remove the tumor, which is great, but it only has a 50 to 80% success rate. So there's usually a lot of, uh, there's 
typically radiation is needed and pharmacological regulation of growth horm hormone is also needed. So, you know, some people are saying there's cognitive problems, some people are not. What there is a lot of difficulty um, in are emotional problems. So people with acromegaly report higher levels of anxiety and depression. Um, and that it's this disorder in particular that people are thinking are mediating the cognitive difficulties, particularly because there is such variability in the literature about whether or not they actually exist. Um, but there are higher rates of mental disorders in people with um, acromegaly, even when compared to people with chronic somatic disorders and healthy control. So this is a very, very distressing condition to people. Um, and people have more Ill, uh, negative illness perception compared with patients with chronic pain, even in controlled acromegaly. So it's not just growth hormone that's the problem with this and psych, uh, psychological functioning. And um, people with acromegaly show the lowest quality of life when compared to patients of all neuroendocrine diseases. So Cushing's disease, prolactinoma, or non-secreting pituitary adenomas. Um, so of all of these, in terms of quality of life, acrom patients with acromegaly do have uh, the poorest outcomes. And not to end on a downer, but there we go. Fortunately, acromegaly is the most rare of all of these conditions. So I apologize, I packed a lot into an hour. Um, I know we probably only have one or two minutes for questions, but I do wanna take them. Um, so let me stop my share and see what people have. Thank you so much, Dr. Penna, for this wonderful lecture. I've learned so much and I'm sure all of our viewers have as well. So thank you again. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, and so one of the questions um, is really um, something that you mentioned um, in regards to the involvement of the mammillary bodies, um, mm -hmm. the craniopharyngioma. And um, one of our viewers is wondering if the neurocognitive profile um, in crani craniopharyngioma is somewhat similar to the profile in uh, Korsakoff. So um, I kind of have two answers to this. So anecdotally, like I said, I, I've only seen three patients with this and it absolutely was. It looked very similar to a Korsakoff's dementia. Um, you know, with, it wasn't quite as flagrant, um, but there was a lot of, and it was really in the memory tests themselves where you saw sort of the confabulation. Um, so it was, you know, it wasn't really in every sort of aspect of life, which you can sometimes see with Korsakoff's and Korsakoff's can tend to have more of a just sort of general disorientation, which I didn't see in the craniopharyngioma patients. In terms of actual research, well-designed uh, experimental research, they don't say, and which is very distressing to me because I was looking it up. I'm like, they've got to mention confabulations in here. And every article I looked at did not specify if there were confabulations or not. They really just talked about that sort of more amnestic learning and memory difficulties. So I will say maybe, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that. I know it can be a little complex answers, maybe, but yeah. And, and I think the problem is the base rates are just so low in order to get, uh, an, you know, enough people that have these dis disorders to actually do um, really sort of well-designed research is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned too that a lot of these are very rare disorders. And so I'm wondering, um, as trainees and the neuropsychologist, when we're working with patients like these and that quality of life aspect, how do you kind of bring that in to your feedbacks um, and, and helping them with quality of life? I think honestly, very often these people are extremely hungry for any information you can give them. Um, so they, they, so obviously I have the most experience with patients with Cushing's disease. I've seen probably about 30 patients with those, um, over my career and they want to know what's going on. They're like, is this for real or is this in my head? Because what they've been told by many, many providers for many, many years is these problems are in your head and like, and not like neurologically in your head. It's you're feeling this way because of something physical or X, Y, or Z. So what they want to know are, do I have, um, do I have 
cognitive deficits. If I do, what can I do about them? Do other people like me have these same cognitive deficits? So people are very hungry for information. They're very receptive and they very much want to be believed. Um, and I think the best thing we can do as neuropsychologists is believe them um, and really sort of reassure them and say, yeah, you know, absolutely. This is tough. And I think also what happens is people in remission, anytime anything happens, like if they have a bad day or stressed out, they think, oh my God, is my tumor coming back? Is my Cushing is coming back? Mm -hmm. So this like really hypersensitivity to any sort of emotional or cognitive changes occurs as a result of this chronic illness. Yeah. And I think normalizing that's really important. Absolutely, absolutely. And then just one last final question. Um, there was a really good question about um, this, these disorders that you mentioned resulting in like disability or inability to work or engage in other life activities. Could you speak a little bit to that of what you've seen? Sure, sure. Um, I think a lot of, so the more rare and severe disorders, so your, um, your acromegaly and your Cushing's disease um, can result in disability, particularly during the active stages. Absolutely. Um, and you know what ends up happening is a lot of times people file for disability and get turned down, and they get turned down again, and they get turned down again. Um, so they do end up, you know, they have a lot of difficulty working, um, and and can result in disability. Um, with growth hormone, also chronic pain is an issue because of those changes to the bones and the joints and things like that. So, you know, that can also be an issue. Craniopharyngiomas, um, because of the memory disorders that can result in uh, disability. Um, but also keep in mind that not everybody with a crani craniopharyngioma is going to have this. So if it's small enough, it's, if it's caught early and they resect it, no problems. So again, I think it's just an issue of when these things are caught and how significant they've, they've sort of been. But yes, you're definitely going to see it with your more rare disorders, your Cushing's, your acromegaly. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Pena, for this wonderful talk that you gave. We've all learned so much and are very appreciative of you. So thank you. No problem. And um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.